Hi there, this is Mr Evans. This video looks at non financial methods of motivation. Been through these financial methods of motivation, now we're looking at non financial methods of motivating employees. So, um, there are probably three main ones that I'll talk about in some detail, and um, a few other, uh, well, many other non financial motivators, which I'll mention a few of at the end. Um, so uh, the two, um, two big non-financial motivators that you would want to really make sure that you know and understand uh, come under the heading of job enlargement. So job enlargement is where we, we change the design of the job so that um, there is a greater scope of tasks, there's a greater range of things for employees to do. That can be done through two methods, job rotation or job enrichment, which I'll talk about in a minute, and teamwork is another important way of um, uh, increasing motivation. So first of all, under the heading of job enlargement, one way that you can increase the uh, scope of a job is to simply train employees so that they can carry out a number of different roles in the workplace and that would all uh, vary their day-to-day -day activities. Now, when I was studying for my GCSEs um, and A-levels, I had a job working in a supermarket and it involved, uh, initially I was uh, just stacking shelves and taking products out and putting them on the shelf and taking them back and um, as much as uh, some people may enjoy uh, working in retail, I really did not uh, enjoy it that much. And one of the things that this supermarket did was it, it trained me to uh, till train me. So I was able to uh, work on the tills from time to time. So, you know, it increased my variety of activities that I could do. And that was quite helpful uh, for me because it prevented me from getting so bored of doing um, just one job. I had two jobs. So what are the advantages for that? Well, employees become more skilled and therefore more flexible. So I was working kind of after school in the early evening and um, you know, it could get really busy uh, from time to time, and in which case, you know, they were able to put out an announcement saying, can, uh, you know, can uh, this employee please report to um, uh, the checkouts, and they can, you know, you've got a more flexible workforce then. You can respond to changes in demand um, because employees have got different skills. And then when it's less busy, you have fewer people on the tills, and, and then they go out and stack the shelves and make sure they're ready for when it gets busy again. Um, and that should reduce the uh, boredom that people may feel in day-to-day uh, -day roles. However, obviously there are training costs. I had to uh, be off the shop floor for some time while I was being trained to work the tills. Um, there was some on-the-job training that took place where I had someone stood behind me for a, you know, a few sessions as I was getting building my confidence on the uh, shop floor, on the till. So, uh, there are costs to training people. Um, and the second argument is that, you know, uh, you could say that, well, basically you've got two fairly boring jobs there instead of just one. Is that really going to um, improve my motivation uh, if I'm just doing two jobs that, that, you know, don't really carry much responsibility, uh, two fairly menial tasks is arguably better than one, but still not fantastic in terms of, you know, that definition of motivation I gave you in the first video, creating the desire to achieve a particular outcome. Right? I don't necessarily know that it made me want to, um, you know, achieve Sainsbury's uh, corporate objectives. So job enrichment uh, is where employees are empowered to make decisions about how to carry out their day-to-day -day role and increases accountability. So rather than making the Rather than giving people more boring jobs, um, job uh, enrichment involves making people actually responsible for having decisions about how to carry out their day-to-day -day activities. So to stick with the supermarket example, a way of enriching that job um, might be to get the uh, team of uh, people who are stacking shelves together and say, look, we've got um, a sales target this month, we want to sell X number of jars of this jam, for example, you guys need to decide how this jam is going to be displayed, where it will be displayed, um, 
in order for us to maximise our um, sales of it and, our, and to hit our targets. And you lot are responsible for making it. And if you make the target, you'll get some sort of reward. So rather than just telling people, oh, I'll go and put this jam out on the shelf, you, you let them decide how they're going to do it, how they're going to present that, and um, that would be a form of empowerment. Um, so why is this good? Well, it develops employees' skills and abilities. Okay, so we're getting into kind of the higher level skills, giving employees self-esteem because they're being trusted to make decisions um, uh, and meeting those needs. Uh, giving them responsibility was one of Herzberg's motivating factors. Um, it makes employees feel valued uh, by the organisation and it increases promotional opportunities for employees because they are going to have a wider range of skills and experience and they're going to know, you know, how to, they're going to be used to making decisions um, uh, within the organisation and therefore uh, they're more capable of taking on management roles. The disadvantages may be the training costs. Um, there may be extra pressure placed on staff, which they don't particularly want. Maybe they're just happy, you know, to a certain extent. I was probably just happy to turn up and be told what to do and get paid money for it. I didn't necessarily want to be held responsible for making decisions uh, when I was working in the supermarket. Um, yeah, and this, this idea of making people responsible, it can be a method of um, kind of you know, reducing the number of managers by stealth. So rather than having a manager making these decisions, you kind of uh, get rid of that managerial role and you tell the staff, well, you're responsible now. So it's, it's kind of the disadvantages come from badly implementing um, this system rather than, um, you know, the actual idea itself. If the idea behind it is to empower staff, make them more interested in the role, providing them with the correct training so they can do that, possibly it will be uh, more of a success than if you're just trying to get rid of some management and you're putting an extra burden on staff instead. Uh, final disadvantage would be short-term costs to job enrichment um, as people get used to their new roles, you know, they may make mistakes, etc. So I just want to take this opportunity just to uh, remind you of the Hatman and Oldham model of job design. They said that uh, jobs should have five characteristics, um, you know, this degree of like autonomy, skill variety, um, receiving feedback, task significance, all of these, um, you know, you can tie this in with this idea of job uh, enrichment, job enlargement. Um, if those characteristics are in place, employees should experience meaningfulness of work, experience responsibility for work outcomes. In other words, employees are held accountable and the knowledge of their actual results will lead to high personal and work outcomes. So this um, idea of uh, these non-financial motivators motivating people through job design um, kind of ties in with what Hatman and Oldham uh, were saying about what would be a um, a good job design to, to lead to these personal and work outcomes. Final uh, idea that you need to know in depth is teamwork. And teamwork can occur when the production process is organised into groups of employees who work together to complete a specific task. So cell production is another way of calling it where employees are grouped into little teams or cells and they are responsible for producing a good. So it was used um, by Japanese firms and Swedish firms, I think Volvo it was, who, um, who uh, redesigned their car production line. So rather than having a flow production line, kind of like Taylor, where you know everyone does their own little bit, they're specialised in the labour, division of labour. Um, rather than that, a team works on producing a car from beginning to end. Okay, so instead of having just one little job in the production process, there's 10 or, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 people whose role it is to actually make the car from scratch and how they divide that work is then up to them. So what are the advantages of doing that? Well, it's going to make, make employees social needs. Okay, so we can link to Maslow. It enables a degree of specialisation. So with the car example, I might be particularly good at tuning engines, for example, and uh, if I'm happy to do that all the time, I can do that and other people in the team can specialise in what they're good at. 
Um, however, it should allow me to vary the days to days activity that I engage in. Okay, so you know, I might decide to work on the body work one day, and if that's okay with the rest of the team, then I can do that. Um, and finally, this enables kind of a matrix structure to occur where employees with different skills collaborate. So I would imagine uh, that Apple, you know, they've got uh, several different products, they've got laptops, they've got phones. I would imagine, say, on the iPhone 7, uh, they've got a, a kind of matrix team involving some people from marketing, some people from operations, uh, some people from HR who all work together to kind of design this product and make it and, and you know I can contribute ideas about marketing and what the customers want and the operations person can kind of explain whether that's possible or not. So it, um, you know, so teamwork uh, brings people with different skills together um, which can be very helpful. Disadvantages, well, there are going to be training costs, maybe we need to train workers with particular skills that they don't currently have to make sure the team is able to complete the task it needs to. Um, there's the potential short-term loss of productivity as staff get used to each other. There's a famous model of, um, uh, I can't remember who it is, but they talk about how teams go through stages of, um, I can't remember all of them, but storming, norming, performing, something like that, storming, you know, at first everyone's kind of at each other's, um, you know, you're kind of getting used to each other, um, you know, maybe having some big arguments, I think that's actually the second stage. Third stage, norming, where, you know, you get used to each other and you start working well together, and then performing, where you really kind of understand each other day to day, and, um, and yeah, the point is that in the short term it can be... Um, there can be uh, time to get used to each other. And finally, if the teams have to be split up, obviously that might be demotivational. Okay, so other non-financial motivators. So these, you know, uh, these have become, well, I won't say become more important, but I don't know if that's true. Um, but companies are always looking for ways to motivate their staff. Um, fringe benefits, such as offering a company car or health insurance or gym membership, uh, would be a way of doing it. it doesn't mean people get a bigger pay packet, so it's a non-financial motivator, um, but it can be extremely motivational. Training, promotion, you know, meeting those needs on Maslow's hierarchy. Um, uh, praise, just giving praise and recognising achievement, meeting those self-esteem needs. Um, having flexible working arrangements, okay, so, uh, you know, particularly for people with families and stuff, it's very really helpful if they can come in maybe a little bit later after the, um, uh, dropping the kids at school or they can leave early to pick them up and then, you know, make up for work later in the evening, you know, working from home, whatever, these can be uh, helpful for people. Having awards such as employee of the month or you know, kind of ties in with that praise idea. Having social events where people get together outside of work to build uh, relations and offering prizes, maybe trips abroad or something like that. All examples of uh, non-financial uh, motivators that can be um, useful in engaging staff in the company.